Welcome to OECD Podcast, where policy meets people. You're listening to our special World in Emotion series, highlighting the topics and speakers of the OECD Forum 2019, starting May 20th in Paris. Hi, I'm Clara Young, and I'm in London at the home of comedian and mental health activist Ruby Wax. Ms. Wax is the president of Relate, a charity that's pushing for more government financial support for relationship counseling. Last year, she also set up Frazzle Cafe with Marks and Spencer, which provides free peer support sessions in cafes around the UK. Ruby is also the author of Sane New World, Taming the Mind, and A Mindfulness for the Frazzled and How to Be Human, The Manual. In classical neoliberal economics, among the many things measured and that matter are GDP and GDP growth. But especially since the financial meltdown of 2008, much of economics has gone through a kind of midlife crisis. Some economists ask whether GDP growth for growth's sake is what we should be shooting for. Shouldn't ultimately we be growing the economy so that more people live better lives, in which we have a good education, a solid roof over our heads, and good health, both physically and mentally. And to bring it all back to classical economics, poor mental health comes with a price tag. According to the OECD, the total costs of mental ill health in the EU are estimated at more than 4% of GDP, or over 600 billion euros. So Ruby, I'm really happy to be able to talk to you about all this sitting in your kitchen like this. You know, I'm glad all this is coming to the surface because many years ago, before I started talking about it, you would mention mental illness and people would roll their eyes. Especially in England, they'd tell you, if I said I had depression, they'd say, oh, perk up. Perk up because I never thought of that. Yeah. And um, so it's, it, it, I think the alarm bell goes off when you say what the economic repercussions are. Then suddenly people stand up and salute. When there's a when there's a cost to yeah. it, people all of a sudden it pay did, attention. It didn't bother them that you know, I, um, it, crime, diabetes too, certain cancers, infertility, obesity, uh, drug related issues, child abuse. It all comes down to where do you think that comes from? You know, it's not a liver infection; it's a mental illness. So they would save so much money if we just put a little bit toward the brain. And it's, it actually is something that a lot of people experience. And I think we're beginning to realize that it's not an uncommon situation. So for you, let's talk about your story. Um, when, did you, when did you experience it for the first time? When I was growing up, nobody had mental illness. It was never a consideration. So I had every blood test known to man. Of course, my mother was mentally ill, but again, in those days, well, the police would come over on a Saturday night where she was really cleaning the ceiling with a Q-tip and say, well, your mother's going through a change of life, meaning, you know, and I said, she's been doing that for 87 years. So by the time I had um, supposedly an illness, we immediately thought it was physical. So I never realized I had mental illness until uh, my third child. The problem with uh, mental illness is that it's a double whammy because your brain goes down and there's no other brain, a spare one, to make the assessment. So you can't get your head around it. You are what's wrong with you. You know, if you have a broken leg, you can feel it or uh, this is this is too odd. You're the last person to know. I finally had to say it to a close friend, do I look crazy to you? And she said, yes, uh, because it's impossible to diagnose it yourself. So how did you figure it out? Well, there is a moment, and I really wish people would distinguish mental illness from sadness. That's kind of insulting or um, in a state of mourning because those are on the human palate. We're supposed to feel that. Otherwise, no poetry. Thank you for reminding us that. Yeah. Sometimes people think we sure, should Sure, they get medication sad. for it. Well, get medication for when you're laughing. Um, but it's a good money spinner. But mental illness... <laughs> It's as serious as Alzheimer's. That's a mental illness. And you wouldn't say to somebody, come on, snap out of it. You remember where you left the car keys. There's no respect for depression. It is a, f a physical uh, illness. There's something wrong. It's just we haven't done enough research onto exactly what that is. If somebody spent a little more money on that, we would have had a cure, I think. I don't want to push anybody, but we might have. I mean, I, we have medication, but that's... You know, it's, it could be placebo, I don't know, but it's better than nothing. 
taking medication is one tree has you know got a problem but you burn down the whole forest so Solving every it. yeah every neuron goes down but that's all we've got i mean chemo is not so sophisticated either i mean you can tell we're in the dark ages with this stuff you think it's important for people who suffer from mental illness to understand how the brain works now why is that it's not important, but it certainly knows if your car breaks down on the motorway, rather than just scream for the AA. If you knew a little bit about how to change the oil, it wouldn't be such a desperate situation. I'm not saying you can fix yourself, but if you understand certainly the beginnings, um, part of the reason I practice mindfulness is because there's no miracle cure, but I can hear it coming. If I can hear it coming early, then I can do something about it. It's forewarning. Usually it just takes you hostage and suddenly your old personality's gone and you're possessed by the devil. I always say it's, you don't have those critical thoughts. You have about 100,000 critical thoughts. And I, it's like if the devil had Tourette's, that's what it would sound like. But if you really put your ear to the ground, like an animal does before a tsunami, you can start to hear the clues that it's coming. And then you can do something about it. In A Mindfulness Guide for the Frazzles and How to Be Human, the manual, you lay out some kind of strategies for dealing mm. with it, don't you? Um, when I got my master's at Oxford, my professor was one of the creators of my mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. It's the two together. And you write a dissertation, but you also do um, a practical. So my practical was a show because I knew I was going to take this to the public through theater, and they let me film that. And, and then I used my show Frazzled. I added comedy and I took it on the road, so it was killing two birds with one stone. But, and it, Mark Williams uh, allowed me to write uh, A, with wit, and B, a more practical guide. He gave me permission to do that. So uh, my exercise is about doing it when you're walking, when you're standing in a queue, when you're having coffee, when you're with your kids, rather than just the hardcore exercises. Right. You're leaving on a tour tomorrow. Yeah. Tell us about it. I did my show Frazzled based on the book 200 times <laughs> around the country and then in Australia and New Zealand. It, it began. Can I tell you how it began? Please do. Oh, okay. I, was a, I worked in TV for 25 years and I would interview some of America's finest, um, but I was already get, losing my mojo in television and I decided I, would, I was always interested in the brain because that's the mothership. And so that's when I applied for Oxford. And to me, knowledge is power. But how long ago were you at Oxford? Oh, I graduated six years ago. Six years ago. Yeah. Okay. And then you came out, you had your degree, and oh, then you developed you, a show. Yeah. I, before I went to Oxford, I'd already been doing shows about mental illness. And the way that came about was um, we have a charity called Comic Relief, and they wanted me to to pose for a little picture to raise money for mental health charities. But instead, without asking me, they put giant posters of me all the way, all the way down the tube station, you know, where they, that, where they advertised I might have, shows. I might have seen those. It was horrific. They didn't ask me, and it said on it, one in four people have mental illness. No, it's worse. One in five people have dandruff. I have both. Ooh. Yeah, and I saw that along with um, the public. And I thought, okay, I've got to do something because I'll lose my job if people know I have mental illness. So I decided I would write a show and pretend that was my publicity poster. That's how it started. I would have never written a show about mental illness. So I wrote a show called Losing It, and I toured mental institutions for two years to get it ready with my people, and then I took it to the public. Now, what do you mean about getting ready with, with your people? Because they... Uh, no, if you know, gave their insights into how no, you if you can get if you can make a bipolar laugh, you're cooking. <laughs> and I used to say their reviews would be, "I laughed, I cried," <laughs> but I love them, you know. And you could see what works, so you don't insult them. But you know, they might they do have a dark right. sense of humor, yeah. and so I knew if it's okay with them, I could take it to the public. It turns out it's not just one or two people. Everybody's got something wrong. Everybody. It may not be mental illness. But the word frazzled, I didn't make up. It's, it's, our, it's our latest uh, condition, which is getting stressed about stress. That never happened before. You know, you were just, an animal was behind you, you got stressed, you know, you needed it for fight or flight. Now, there's daisy chaining of thoughts, and our thoughts are what's killing us. There's no predator. Now, in your opinion, why is that? What's going on now that we're feeling so easily frazzled? What do you put the blame on? 
Well, part of our brain is still Stone Age. I mean, that's just a fact, you know, from back in the bush. And it doesn't realize the wallpaper's changed. So we can't deal with a lot of the complexities of the 21st century. We, we were always dependent on tools. You know, animals had teeth and uh, claws. We always had to build tools to defend ourselves. So technology was inevitable. It's just that we used the tools, we used the telephone, we used um, the printing press, but now technology, just by the nature, is, is using us. So we always thought that would give us free time. Well, spare time, could you define spare time? Well, it just gives us more time to be frazzled, I suppose. More time, and now you're chasing the beast because somebody forgot to mention, and again, it's knowledge of the brain a little bit, is that we're creatures of addiction. So if we get something to eat, we'll eat the next bite faster. So we just had a report at the OEC that came out about digital technologies and how the internet and social media affect mental health. And you just brought up one of the big ones, which is addiction. There's also cyberbullying is a very big problem, low self-esteem. Uh, sure, girls you know, used to compete for who's the prettiest and who's the most popular, even when I was growing up. But thanks to social media, you're competing globally. You know, uh, I, I don't know if I can say this, but now little girls, they're not just competing with their friends, they're competing with supermodels. You can't get away from it. No, you're going to have low self-esteem. We need stress. Otherwise, where's the progress? But when the incident is over that created it, you know, your job is done, usually the stress would go down, you'd spend time with your family. But now... If, a, if you're about to be mugged or there's physical fear, it registers in the same part of your brain as, as uh, social fear. So, of course, not being approved of or somebody not giving you a thumbs up for your photo, what you had for lunch, that also makes that cortisol race. And so, again, we're competing all the time. And the advertisers know exactly how to stimulate that area by saying here's 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 the areas you'll never have enough you'll never win this one but if you buy this product you just might have a chance what are some strategies that work for example crisis lines that you can access from your cell phone or, or from the internet or or mental basic mental health education in schools what what have you found that mm. you think oh that works that's that really is effective the problem is that we're getting, again, stressed about something that we can do nothing about. You see talk shows, you know, we're discussing it. Well, we're just pumping up our fear. It's coming, and we made it come. You know, it what didn't fall in our garden like a meteorite. So now what we have to do is learn techniques to navigate the noise, to figure out, you know, how to upgrade our own minds as much as we've upgraded our iPhones. Because, again, our brain now is in our hands. It's not going to evolve anymore. The real evolution takes place with technology, so we've got to keep up with it. And it's possible, so let's not get hysterical. But I, if there was something that could just tell you when your cortisol getting to a dangerous point, and there is nothing yet. You know, people say, oh, there's Muse or there's EEG sets. There, are, There's nothing. But if it could say you're at your tipping point, okay, you may think you can work as fast as the next guy, but one more hour and you're burned, which means you can't produce anymore and maybe have a heart attack. If it could tell you that and then give you personalized ways of um, de-stressing, you know, that because it, it could read you, maybe pet your cat, go for a walk, follow my breathing. It would understand what pulls your cortisol down. Then we're getting somewhere. So, so we some, can use AI. So something like a, a car that tells you your gas tank is getting low. Oh, exactly. The lights flash. But they don't frighten you because then, you know, the advertising for cigarettes didn't work because it scared you so much you lit up another one. But it gently, you know, because part of training yourself is not to beat yourself up. That's stress about stress. But to gently say, this is, let the next guy run at 3 o'clock in the morning this is going to kill you. Run a little bit. How much is um, the problem with mental illness, the illness itself, and how much is it the social stigma that's attached to the illness? You know, a lot of people come to my show, and in the second half, I let the audience speak. It's as if I've done a kind of mental striptease to say, well, here's my vulnerability. Then they feel free, and it can be a large auditorium, is that they're starting to stand up and go, this is my story, this is what's going on for me, what do I do about my daughter? It, you know, I wanted to throw myself in front of it. They're standing up because they want to be heard. The isolation is what's driving up the cortisol. So um, I decided 
that's half the cure is being able to talk because in this world, not only do we have the strain, but you can never say what's really going on. You have to say, fine, who came up with that? Or as I say, we have to be perfect. When did we start? That's against human nature. I mean, look at the person next to you, totally flawed. We should be, you know, stand up and be proud of your glitches. So um, I started, uh, I thought everybody wants to talk. So I used my theaters when I was in the West, in, in London for a long time as walk-in centers. And I would bring in the big boys like Peter Fonagy or Mark Williams or Louis Walport. And they would, the public could come in off the street. And then I had a whole stream of um, mental health of volunteers from SANE. And now they could come in and start to open their mouths. And one girl said, I, was, I wanted to commit suicide when I came here. Well, she came every day until five people ran to her and became her support system. So then I thought, oh wait, this is what we need. Because I'd created Black Dog Tribe online. And I said, we need face-to-face. -face. AA always had it. How come we can't? Very jealous of AA. So I created <laughs> Frazzle Cafes. Uh, Marks and Spencer's is a franchise here. It's a shop with a ca they have cafes. Yeah. They're huge. And they said, okay, they would shut down their cafes at a designated time. And then we would, you can't walk in. You have to sign up to frazzlecafe.com. And we invite groups of 15 and get a facilitator that we've trained at the Welcome Trust, and they meet every two weeks. So this becomes where the, the, the slogan is, it's okay to not be okay. And if you go in there, which I do, these people are talking straight from the heart, and it just is, it's humanity at its best. That's when you, you go, oh, I see, I'm proud to be part of the human race, not when they're just you know, showing, cocking their tail feathers. Mm -hmm. I don't like people who are fine. They piss me off. <laughs> and so that's the joy of Frazzle Cafe. Right. Maybe um, technology can come up with something like that someday. Mm. But it hasn't yet. So the, the, one of the big answers seems to be don't isolate yourself. But you can say don't. And then it's like saying have positive thoughts. That makes me even more depressed because mm. I can't. Because I am isolated. Because I'm ashamed to talk to my friends about it. I never did or you don't want to bother your family. That's just the culture. Mm. Now, somebody has to step it up, so I can't, I'm not political, I can't change the world, but I can offer little groups. And certainly when, after my show, I talk to anybody who comes up and talks to me truthfully. That's just food, that just gives me energy. That's what, what's interesting about us, our vulnerability. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the vulnerability that also uh, manifests itself in, uh, when we have these problems, we don't often, most of us don't go and seek help. And I got You can't get help. Forget about it. You know, A, it costs too much money. Mm. B, how do you know you're getting the real thing? I mean, I got a degree in psychotherapy just so I could figure out who's ripping me off. You don't know what a good therapist is because you're ill. How would you know? You're, it's like getting somebody to paint your house and you're blind. So um, we have to get, have other interventions that A, are free. B, maybe um, you can't get a hospital bed either. So if you get really ill, good luck. Sometimes I have a little, maybe some younger kid at my show, and they really are on the verge of suicide, and I'll go with them to the emergency ward and say, they're having kidney failure. Could you let them in? Because if it's mental, they're not getting in. The waiting lists are months. Yeah, the, and... and uh, it, it, it is, and it does come down to, to the expense the the money the cost of therapy of any kind are you making headway with relate uh, on getting more you know, the governments behind uh, putting more money into into mental health therapies well my thing is more neuroscience i think they there has to be more exploration of the mind so i'm on the chair of the british neuroscience association and on the <laughs> at the anna freud center where they do do research on what happens in the mind. Only if they do that can we find some kind of, well, hopefully personalized uh, intervention that could help us. For one person, therapy is the right thing. For another person, it's mindfulness. For another person, forget it. They exactly. just need the drugs. We have to figure it out. We need to offer a panoply. Or at least be able to test somebody and say, this is going to work. Don't waste your time. If, a kid, if therapy isn't working on a kid, move it pretty quickly. What other... Uh messages do you want to make clear to people who 
don't think about mental health, have never thought about it, maybe don't realize. They yeah, have well problems. then look to their look to their family or their friends. They they probably are next door or in the house. It's not that foreign an object. And what should we all be looking for? How do we know? Oh. Well, the person who's got the mental illness knows, okay? If you try to step on it or subdue it, it will, like a wild animal, it won't go away. The real thing won't go away. That's why so much money is missing every year. You cannot go to the office and do any work when you have mental illness. As I say, stress is good. Go out and jog. You know, take the stress off. Mental illness, it's like cancer. You cannot wish it away. There has to be. For me, good luck being bipolar without the medication or schizophrenic. But um, somebody, a doctor, should distinguish between anxiety, which we live in, and mental illness. Are you working on a book right now? Yeah. I'm writing uh, now, it's tentatively called To the Future with Love, because I wanted to see what, um, the, where the green shoots are now, you know, that are making the future more hopeful. Because all we get, see, there's only bad news now, because that makes money. So I, I say in my show, in How to Be Human, those producers of the news know exactly what they're doing. They're showing us more and more gore, again, because we're addicted, and B, because part of us is quite savage. And then we can't think clearly when we're in high levels of fear, so we watch even more news to find out, why do I feel like this? And then we pick leaders who we think will help us get rid of the terror, not realizing they're the cause of it. We're not thinking clearly. And again, we should know fear bumps it up, and yet it tastes so good. Um, but, you know, a little knowledge to understand that. I mean... You just mean turn a it off to, to understand uh, this this cycle. Uh, to understand this, this is the human condition. Again, I say we are not our fault, and how to be human is about the contribution. It didn't evolution work for us because it made us survive from hundreds of thousands of years ago. It's just that we don't have techniques now to deal with where we are now. So it's almost we have to thank our thoughts for being negative. If you weren't paranoid and didn't think something was about to eat you, you wouldn't be sitting here today. It's fight or flight. Yeah, but the, the problem is, understand, that's our nature. If somebody said out of five thoughts, four of them are negative. It's supposed to happen, so don't beat yourself up for it. In a way, I say, you know, we're hardwired for it. So again, a little bit of knowledge means... Again, always learning it's not your condition, it's a human condition. This is why we think how we think. I talk about that in the show. This is emotions. This is why we choose the partners we choose in general. But pretty much if you took this, you know, open the boot, we're all, we all have the same plumbing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Underneath all these hoods, there's a similarity. It doesn't matter what country you come from. Well, Ruby, thank you very much for talking to us. Um, and thanks everybody for listening to OECD podcasts. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I'm Clara Young. And to find out more about OECD work on mental health issues, look up OECD and mental health. And of course, read Ruby Wax's book, How to Be Human, the manual, as well as a mindfulness guide for the frazzled. Thank you for listening to OECD podcasts. You can learn more on this topic at the 2019 OECD Forum, World in Emotion, taking place May 20th and 21st. To listen to more OECD podcasts, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and soundcloud.com slash OECD.